Hello, and welcome back to Unconventional Creatives. I'm Stacy. I'm the technical director at Tableau Creative. It's been a while since we've put out a video, but we have a new one for you today. You are about to watch our interview with Hadil. She is an architect and the co-founder and co-host of the podcast Design to Connect. So if you're not subscribed already, be sure to hit that subscribe button and also leave a comment down below. We would love to engage with you in a conversation about what you are about to listen to. So we hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, Hadil, thank you so much for having us in your space today. Wow, well, thank you for being here. So I'm really curious to know what brought you to the profession of architecture? Is this something that you've always wanted to do or was there like certain life experiences that kind of guided you to this path? Um, I think it's a bunch of things. Uh, for sure the life experiences and the area and the household that I grew up in uh, influenced a lot of the choices that I've made. Um, I lived in a town um, just at the border of the city that I'm originally from. It's called Rimaide. And this the city is this, the border of South Lebanon. And I was in that town, there was a lot of um, like refugee uh, houses that um, those were really my only neighbors that I had interactions with. Uh, but then when I used to go to the city, it's like I'm in a completely different reality or a completely different world. So that started me questioning first of all other than all the questions that i'm like why are these people living in in one room like a, a family or six or like family of five or even one person why is one person living in such life conditions started intrigued that questioning in me and like to ask you know why am i living in a safe place when they're not like I like I grew up there so like ever since I was a kid I was uh, interacting with the, the kids my age um, in that area like ever since I was like six um, it bothered me because I, I used to go to school and I'm like those are the people like the kids that I was playing with in the same time and they never had those privileges and I think another thing that um, Ex like exposed me to start seeing the world from different lenses is because I had the privilege to go to a private school because my dad was the mechanic like the supervisor of the school so we had the opportunity to get like you know a certain discounts to get to to to, to have certain education uh, but I saw the differences because obviously we didn't come like we came from a like low middle class family while the school that I was in came from a different reality. So I was never able like I was already an outsider um, in that school. And that also triggered a lot of questions because first of all, I did feel different. I felt very out of place, um, but I it made me ask to why certain people have privileges and are given opportunities and others that deserve it don't and while i started questioning like that i obviously ever since i was a kid i knew that i loved art i i was i have i had this creative side of me but i didn't i don't think i had the space the safe space to explore that um and I'm like, okay, what can, what can I, what profession is going to satisfy the family in a way that it's like, okay, there's an educational aspect to it. There's, there's, um, uh, the, the, the society is going to accept it as a profession rather than just be like, oh, I'm going to, I'm that a creative person. The art is just unseen in Lebanon, you know, like when I remember when uh, my parents used to go to uh, the parents meetings and they were like, wow, your daughter is excelling in art. They, they just look at me and be like, what is this? You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I, I used to get attacked a lot because of my creative side. Um, so I started exploring options to, okay, what profession I can integrate these things. I can integrate the art side, uh, the artistic side of me, I integrate the educational aspect of it. And then in the same time, I'm going to be able to give back to the community because my goal was that I needed to figure out a way to help people with potential 
at least give them a safe place first because to me this is where it starts you need a safe space to f to be in to be able to nourish yourself and to explore and to l figure out who you are if you're not given that space you know it's pointless so that's where i i'd say like at the age of 14 i started uh exploring architecture more like as a profession as an industry and then my dad pushed me further to it because he always um like said that he would like one of his kids to become an architect so i think definitely this played me like a role also in my decision um and then i started exploring that so yeah i think a lot of people myself included are very ignorant of what the what a day uh in the work of an architect looks like so maybe you can demystify that for us a little bit and tell us what and maybe not every day looks the same but like mm. what sorts of tasks and um, uh, skills that you're practicing in your work okay so there's a, there's different ways I can answer that question because I don't think there is one way of doing architecture there's completely different ways of what architecture means so the way I'm practicing architecture I would say is more on the mainstream because I am more on the corporate side of it right but is this what architecture is 100% no in my perspective I think like what architects are in my perspective or what architecture should be is that balance between uh, um, understanding the, your community understanding your community needs and delivering those spaces based on those needs what we're doing and what architects are doing these days or okay let's backtrack a little bit and let, let me tell you about what architecture is in the mainstream or what I do on a daily basis. So I work in a, uh, in a corporate company that we do uh, condo developments. So my day to day basis is the interactions with consultants, interactions with the clients, understands their needs of, okay, we have this land and we're trying to build a condo. So you try to figure out what's the best um, envelope that's going to fit on this land. We start with experimenting with different designs uh, while we're exploring, exploring the building co codes, while we're doing you know, cons um, interactions, coordinations with different consultants, with mechanical, structural engineer, um, and electrical. So there's a lot of coordination that happens during the day. There's a lot of stress um, and want, like, you know, like a lot of hard time um, that goes through the day, to be honest. Um, just because of the amount of stress that one person is put in. So coordination, I said, you know, a lot of uh, trial and error while you're designing because you think you're designing something right. And then once you start inter creating all those elements to into the, the, the in your initial design, you realize that it's wrong. Uh, and then you have to go back to um, point zero. So that's like the beginning phase of the design. And then obviously we carry on the design into a, a design development stage and then the construction phase where the tasks are completely different because now you're so dealing with the uh, site supervisor, you're dealing with different trades, you're dealing with the contractor and you're on site. You're trying to make sure that whatever you designed in the beginning and whatever details that you created in the beginning are being designed per your per um, your drawings so the project goes through phases so that's why it's hard for me to tell you what an architecture job is just uh, by a simple statement so that's the corporate side but then there's the humanitarian side to architecture and those are more um, architects that are involved more in the nonprofit world or the humanitarian side so they are more uh, policy Inter like they they're integrated more with the policy world uh they're integrated more with um the community um marginalized communities more than anything uh for us for them to understand what is it that this community lacks um to help and provide for them so those are two sides of architecture what is something that you feel like the society is lacking more specifically in you know the downtown Toronto core that we're in right now, are you seeing certain needs that you feel like are not being fulfilled by 
whether it's these corporate condo developments or um, other forms of architecture? Wow. Yes, I think so. I think, um, let's start saying that I think we lack empathy and understanding. That has nothing to do with architecture but or the, the profession, but it is linked. Because if we lack those two characters, how are we able to... Like, so if you're the client, right, and you're coming to me and be like, okay, I need to do one, two, three, how am I able to transform your ideas or your needs into something sustainable or something uh, efficient or something that will is responding to your needs, right? So I think because we're lacking that and we're looking at everything based on what is this going to generate me from a money value, we... We, start, we stop seeing how we are creating the space into something that's good or for the benefits of the community. So when we're designing, and let me talk about what I know best. So if I'm designing uh, um, a condo development, but when I talk to all my friends and all my surroundings and everyone is, you know, is hurting because of the small spaces they're hurting because they're not feeling that they're having the right infrastructure to live in they're they can't even afford it you know what i mean so does that mean we're failing or are we succeeding as architects by providing these spaces if i'm an architect i'm living in a building that i've designed and i can't even afford it so am i failing here or am i doing something good so I think this is where we need, we need that connection between the developer and we need the connection between the community and who, who are they building for? Are they really building for the citizens of Toronto or I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> who are we building for? <laughs> so a lot of these topics that we're touching on here, you and your co-host Ari Zhu talk about a lot in your podcast, Design to Connect. Yes. And I would love to know how you connected with her and also what led you guys to want to create a podcast and talk about these things. Oh my God. Okay. Um, I hope I'll be able to like make my answer short. So I was going through this phase of uh, questioning things a lot. And for the first time I felt that like, I'm okay. So I, I'm not a person that knows how to ask for help. I am a very um, independent person and, and I, I think because of my upbringing and the experiences and the things that I was put in, I, I have major uh, issues with connecting with people. But I took on to, to, to I was at, like, you know, when you, when you reach rock bottom and you're trying to get out of that rock bottom, you, you be like, okay, I'm going to challenge myself because clearly what I was doing is not working for me. So let's start exploring other ways and that's when i'm like i need to connect with people that think like me because i i need i need help and i need support in my thinking process so that's where my journey started uh on linkedin i was starting to write posts about like the industry about questions that i was having and for one time, the algorithm, I think, worked for my benefit because I started seeing similar posts on LinkedIn that with people that are writing s similar things to what I was um, posting at that time. And I connected with Arizu on LinkedIn and I sent her a message and I'm like, you know, I really enjoy the, some of the posts that you're writing and I would like to explore or have a conversation with you if, uh, if you're open to it because I'm going through a similar journey and I would like to know where you're at. Uh, so we connected because of LinkedIn. We started on a Zoom call and then we hit it off right away. Like this is the first time I was like having a conversation where I felt safe, where I felt that no one is gonna, no one is judging me because I'm like asking questions like this. No one is judging me because I'm questioning things. But if anything, we were like hitting it off. And also, I, I, um, I was like. I don't think I was in the right mental state. So for someone to understand that my personality and understand that like sometimes I'm going to be like talking to you like five minutes stop and then at one point I'm just going to like be quiet. So to find that person that understood me to that extent, like every zoo did and the person that challenged me, um, I felt very comfortable. Uh, so she's like, why don't we turn this into a podcast? And I'm like, okay, no, easy there. <laughs> 
<laughs> like I'm already like starting to push myself out of my bubble. So for me to like take it on to a podcast, that's a whole new challenge. But I'm like, you know what? Let's do it. And so we connected on LinkedIn September 7th. Um, we right away started because I was telling her some of the thoughts that I was having. Like I was already in the process of thinking about what I wanted to do with my skills. My dream was to always have a nonprofit organization for myself. Um, and But again, why why did I have that dream? You know, those are questions that I, I we had together. I'm like, is it a dream because of, what society made me think that I can do, I can only do with my skills. Uh, so we're like, okay, let's explore different uh, ventures. And for us, because when I connected with her and we started talking about deep conversations and I saw the comfort that it brought to me, and I'm like, that's what we need to do. We need to connect with like-minded people and start having these deep conversations for us to learn and for us to understand that, you know what, there isn't a linear way of doing things. I need to understand and learn from different experiences because this is the only way I'm going to get to point B by seeing how other people did it, what works for me, what works for, for what wouldn't work for me, and learn that other people saw that there was certain mistakes. What did they do to challenge these mistakes? What solutions did they come up with for me to see like, okay, is this a sustainable solution or let's backtrack a little bit and try something new. And it's been one of the most rewarding, amazing journeys that I've been to. And it's honestly, I resume pushes my boundaries every day, but in a very, very nice way, in a very beautiful way. And I'm forever grateful for that experience, really. I definitely want to talk about the substance of that a little bit more, but okay. let's take a, a side tangent here. Um, from a technical side, what are some of the challenges that you had actually putting this podcast and the YouTube channel together? Because um, I know you don't have like a media production background mm -hmm. or anything like that. But so many people are starting their own podcasts from home with like whatever technology that they have uh, available to them. So especially because, you know, you and Arizu are connecting remotely and most of your guests are too, that you're having conversations with. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can talk about that process a little bit. Of course. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that you asked that question because I think this was one of the reasons that held me back from taking any uh, um, step forward. Um, again, I am on a very, very tight budget. I am struggling financially. I, I have my full-time job and I have two other part-time jobs. So for me, it's like, okay, like I cannot afford to, I can't, like, I barely have a working laptop. I can't afford getting all these podcast equipments. I, I can't, like, I, I chose to invest the, the little money that I have in other things for that for whatever reason right so when we started design to connect i'm like you know what this is the time for me to be to to, to see that i can do it with whatever equipment or whatever with whatever i have so i'm i'm gonna stop putting these limitations in my way because right now am i not i might not get to point b where, or where I want to be, but at least I started somewhere. So everything I do is from my phone. The only thing that I bought was really this phone holder that I stuck to my table and I'm able just to like, you know, to, to videotape from it. Um, but everything, and that's why we decided to do the conversations on Zoom because, you know, this is the only platform that's giving us the access to connect with people from different places in this world. And uh, Arizu has that skill set of editing uh, videos. Um, so she does the, all the editing um, uh, of the videos with whatever she taught herself from YouTube videos. All of that is self-taught. And um, same thing with the posts that we do. You know, we downloaded Canvas and we just do everything on Canvas for free. Um, and we're learning as, as we go. The challenges that we find is definitely the human interaction. Like I am, I, I need to feel someone's energy. I need to feel someone's presence for me to click. And, and I thought that w was gonna f be challenging for me, especially that I'm, I'm an extreme introvert. So like if if I didn't feel safe with someone, I might not be able to connect. But then I'm like, okay, 
the guests that we're bringing to our platform clearly think alike. So why am I scared of that? You know, just let it be. Um, and that's how we're doing it. We're doing it on Zoom. And then we take that video and then we're trying to keep it as natural as possible. So even if there were flaws in the videos, for example, the other time we uh, we did a video and Arizu like was very tired. She got to a point also her blood pressure like went down and she's like, I'm very tired. And she said it. And I'm like, no, we should keep it like it's OK. Like it's we're allowed to say that we are tired and it reflected like that on in the video. So people understand that we're not perfect all the time. Um, and of, or if like there was, if I, if you were talking and I over talked or over like whatever, that's fine. You know, like it's okay. It's, it's a natural conversation. I'm not going to just like be like, okay, I'm, is this like the, the time for me to talk right now? We're just letting it be. Some people think that's careless, but. Well, I think when, you know, when the pandemic started, when we were first in lockdown, mm -hmm. a lot of even you know, shows that used to be uh, done together in a studio setting, people started doing it from their own homes and that, you know, little bit of a time delay where people are talking over each other. I think our allowance as an audience has kind mm -hmm. of opened up. We have more, we're more willing to see those flaws in real time because that's just the reality that we're, we're working with um, from a, the technical you know, limitations that are in place. Mm. But I think what's so intriguing about the conversations that you have with your, um, with your guests, you talk a lot about the importance of empathy mm. and, you know, both, um, both everyone who's involved in this conversation is being very vulnerable mm. in, in a way that can sometimes feel, um, you know, very nerve wracking uh, when you're having these conversations in public, especially about your, um, your what you do for a living. Um, so I wonder uh, if you could give any advice to people who maybe want to do something similar, even if it's outside of architecture, let's say, um, you know, a social media manager who wants to criticize Silicon Valley or the way that social media is changing the way that we behave in public, but maybe they're apprehen apprehensive to have those conversations because there might be some repercussions mm. in their professional work. Um, I think it takes a lot of courage for you to do what you're, what you're doing, and I really admire oh, it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, maybe you could speak to that a little bit. I think there's so many layers. Um, that I can answer to that question. I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to gather all my thoughts. Um, Does it get easier as time goes by? For sure. For sure. It gets easier because you realize that all those roadblocks that you had in your mind or the worries are meaningless. You know, I think that's that's the biggest lesson I've learned that stop caring so much about what others are gonna think or mis or interpret your um, what you're trying to do because there's always gonna be that person that's gonna misinterpret your intentions. There's no way, you know, like your intentions are always gonna be misinterpreted one way or another. So why care? You know, like why not experiment? Why not explore? Because how are you gonna know if you do if you don't just go for it, try, and. And I think because this was a big challenge for me, like I, I'm, I'm a, I, I hated the fact that I was an empathetic person because I was bullied for it, right? It's not, it, it's not something like I didn't just become this person out of nowhere. Like I went through very serious mental health issues for me to be in the place I am, and that's why I, 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 I feel very strong right now to push people out of the comfort zone, because the second that you're out of your comfort zone is the second where you're gonna uh, evolve. So I would say that start to finding um, means of doing things, at least like within your comfort zone, if you wanna start doing that, but ex by exploring, exploring different venues, different sides of your personality, your character, and then slowly, slowly 
you know, take baby steps to do things that you like and stop caring. That, that's all I can say. I don't know. Stop caring. Stop worrying. I love what you uh, mentioned about Arizu and how she allowed you to feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you are pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, I can say from, you know, working with my business partner, Sandra, that we're always pushing each other. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have had a very different experience if I tried to do it all on my own. I'm and sorry. having someone that is your, your partner in this venture that can be there for you to support you emotionally when you're having a bad day because not every day is going to look the same. But who also, even in your those points where you feel you're at your weakest or your most um, self-conscious, mm. that they can kind of shake you out of that and give you a little outsider perspective. Um, so, yeah, do you feel like if you were to do this podcast on your own, would you even have done it without your co-host? I don't think I would have succeeded the way I did. I am right now. In my perspective, I am succeeding because I don't look at it from just what, um, you know, the, the views or where I'm at or how many followers. I think I'm succeeding because the confidence that this podcast is giving me is worth is beyond anything tangible. Um, and that's why I think I'm succeeding because I am growing as a person. Um, and I wanted to add something also as part of the advice and uh, like an, to carry on the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think what's important is that we need to stop seeking validation from the people that we think or to, to seek support from our circle. Because especially when you feel like you're unique or you're different or y the way that you're seeking things is different than your surroundings then you need to learn to stop seeking support from the, from them because it's never like it's you're never gonna feel satisfied that way you know and and that will pull you back rather than push you forward so another advice is that start looking for or connecting with people that you are gonna feel that are gonna push you forward or understand you and just listen and provide you the support that you need so, yeah. Okay, I'll go back to the other question. What was it? <laughs> uh, yeah, just like, do you think you would have done this on your own without Arizu to, like, support you? Do I think you it would have taken me uh, more time, for sure. And like I said, uh, Arizu accelerated the process and showed me skills and showed me things in myself that I, I never th um, recognized. You know, I was very, for example, like writing. I was very shy. I was very hesitant in sharing my writings and my posts. And now I feel that this is a big outlet for me to do that. So, yeah. All right. Well, for our audience who's not familiar with, uh, with your podcast, you, maybe you can let them know where they can listen and where they can follow you on uh, social platforms. Sure. So you can follow us on Instagram, Design to Connect, um, on LinkedIn, Design to Connect, and our YouTube channel, Design to Connect. Of course, there'll be a link in the description down below yeah. to subscribe. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hadil. Thank I you. really enjoyed that. Wow, me too. <laughs>